Jesus has got me. I can make a lot of mistakes, but he never does. And I'm safe with him and secure with him, and I am thankful to be there. Thank you, singers, for what you have done tonight. Please don't be afraid if I pull out a water bottle. There was a story told one time of a minister who kept filling a glass with water on the pulpit, and after about two hours, someone in the back said, what do you think? And the other guy said, it's the first time I've ever seen a windmill that ran on water. Hopefully that won't be true with, with things tonight. I am thankful and honored to be here in this position. It's a, it's a very responsible one. I, I, I know you're used to good preaching with Brother Gary and last week with Brother Brankel, so maybe you can think of me tonight as a plate of spam in a steakhouse. But at the same time, when you're asked to fill a pulpit in a service, you have a unique place and a unique responsibility. See, up until now, our praise has been going to God, and He's been hearing our praise. But from here on out, the responsibility of the minister is to take what God would say and put it out to where we humans can hear it. Our praises flow up, God's directives flow back down. And so I'm very conscious tonight that, that uh, if I don't find what God would have for us, it's been a wasted night. However, I will say I think I'm touching upon that right subject. And I think I have something to say that will be of help to every person in this room, whether it is tonight or whether it's another night on down the road. You're going to need what we're going to talk about tonight. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 18, verse number 1. I want to read 11 verses here, and then we'll go back and kind of do a little, a little apple picking out of this. Our reading says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the Sabbath every synagogue, or in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Years ago, my grandfather was an Assembly of God preacher, and he was in charge of all the Assemblies of God churches in the states of Arkansas and Louisiana. Now, back in those days, there weren't near as many, but it was kind of tough to get to them all because they tended to be in out-of-the-way places. Grandpa told a story one time. You had to understand Grandpa. He was his own man, and there are a few people in the church today who may have had an acquaintance with him, Brother Brankel especially, and Grandpa was unique. He was known to just show up at a preacher's house at 2 o'clock in the morning or to call the preacher from the bus station and say, come get me. He didn't make a lot of appointments ahead of time. That's just not how things were done back then. Well, in this particular case, he showed up at a minister's home, a pastor's home, and he found the pastor in the backyard. 
Now, you had to understand that this pastor was a fairly young man. He had been married an appropriate amount of times, and his wife had just given birth to triplets. She was in bed. She was sick from this ordeal, and all three of the triplets had severely upset stomachs. This was back before Pampers came along, and uh, Samsung was still in China, and Whirlpool was still out in the river. And if you are a seasoned enough citizen, you know that your way of getting cloth diapers clean in that day was to build a fire in the backyard and boil water in a big iron kettle and work it out. Now, here's this poor young man, not married long, not a father long, in the backyard with a gigantic mountain of dirty diapers and a big fire going under the kettle, and he is having a pity party. And he's praying out loud, not knowing that my grandpa, his, super, his supervisor, was coming to see him and could hear him. And he was saying, Lord, there ain't nobody had it as bad as I've got it. This is the worst thing that ever happened to anybody. I am so far down in the, oh, God, you're just going to, and, and Grandpa showed up. Think of how embarrassed he was. And Grandpa said, I just had to sit down with him and tell him of some of my own experiences. And hopefully I left him with a little better condition and with a little more encouragement than he did before. Listen, brothers and sisters, there is nothing in life much more difficult to deal with than discouragement. It literally will change you. It'll change your belief system. You get discouraged, you believe everybody's bad. Nothing's good. God's dead. The devil's alive and well. You'll believe all of these things. It'll change your personality. You go from being a happy person to a sad and a morbid person. And people don't want to be around people like that. It'll change your outlook from looking at things and thinking what can go right. You'll look at them and think what can go wrong. Paul Harvey had a feature in his newscast that I always liked. He would tell the story of someone who really messed things up, and he would get to the end, and he would say, this man said, there's no use worrying. Nothing's going to turn out all right. And if you're discouraged, that's the way you're going to feel. Your song will change. You used to sing something pleasant and happy, but now if you went out to your truck and you looked at the 8-track in your dash or whatever it might be, what would pop up? Ray Charles, born to lose. You look at the TV. What's your favorite show on TV? It's Hee Haw. So you can see the quartet sing, Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And I'll quit singing at this point because I don't want to ruin anyone's supper. But I hope you understand my point. You turn from being a person who looks for the good to being a person who looks for the bad. And you even end up going to a blues festival. Now, I'm... I, I look at things strangely. I have enough trouble. I don't need somebody singing about their truck blowing up and their dog running off and, and everybody against them and I've lost my job. I don't need that. That just shows me a little further. I want to go to a happy festival if there was such a thing. But that's how you are. When you get discouraged, your behavior will change. What can go wrong? Well, let me count the ways. Everything I try is going to blow up like a little boy who was on my son's baseball team years ago. And he would come out swinging a bat and saying, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss the ball. I can't hit it. I can't hit it. I'm going to miss. Watch me. I'm going to strike out every single time he came out to go to the plate. That's what he was saying. And most of the time, unfortunately, he was accurate. And it'll even change your appearance. You'll go from somebody who's 
looking pretty good to somebody who's all bent over and bowed, and, and, and ladies, discouragement will increase wrinkles in your face in the wrong place. The real problem, though, with discouragement is not so much the discouragement itself. It what's, it's what grows out of the discouragement. Because discouragement, in a way, is a seed that will produce a plant that will change your life. Discouragement makes you feel bad. And when you feel bad, it's easier for the devil to get to you and knock you off course and ruin your life. He doesn't wait till you're feeling zippity doo da to come at you. He waits till you're at your weakest. And when you don't feel good, it's awful easy to get that way. Discouragement destroys your faith and other things about you. It leads to depression. Depression is rough, and, and I don't want to go to depression tonight. That's not the subject I want to talk about. But let me tell you, much of depression I think that we deal with starts with repeated disappointment where it happens over and over and over and over again, and before long we can't believe that anything else can happen. Dis dis uh, discouragement will lead you to quitting. Let me tell you that you're not alone if you are discouraged tonight. There's a lot of good people in the Word of God who faced discouragement. I was thinking of them this morning, and I thought of Moses, who had frustrations with everybody. He had to be disappointed in Israel. I thought of, of Samuel, who really wanted Saul to be king and mourned for him. He had to be disappointed in Saul. I thought of David with his ups and downs. I thought of poor old Elijah sitting out under that tree all by himself feeling bad and sorry for himself. These are people we consider to be uh, great stalwarts of faith and great people. And sometimes we look at these people and we see only the real high points and we don't look at the humanity that is underneath it. Listen, God never sought superhumans to do his job. He's t he looks for regular people to do super work. And so those who, who, uh, who have served God for a long time and we think they've got it made, it ain't necessarily so. Even Paul faces discouragement. And when I read this passage, th the thought of discouragement leaped out at me. We don't have time tonight to go back to Acts 17. But if you read Acts 17, I think this is one of the low points of Paul's entire life. He is ministering in a new place, and hopefully he's going to have great results for the kingdom of God. But uh, verses 16 through 34 of that chapter tell me that Paul's got some things that probably, almost certainly, were discouraging to him. Verse 16 tells us he was alone. I've been alone before, and the most discouraging times in my life were times when I was all by myself. I think right now of a time when I was overseas in a nation that didn't speak English, and I was literally out on the street all by myself. Now, some things had happened in my life. Some situations had come up. I didn't know what to do or when to do it. And it became a matter of great discouragement to me. What in the world am I ever, how am I ever going to face this thing? And Paul's that way. It tells us also in verse 32 that he's done his best and nothing came from it. He's preached as hard to the Athenians as he did to anybody else. Nobody has responded. In fact, it's not just that they did not respond, but verse 32 tells us that he was ridiculed and mocked. Let me tell you, that'll make you discouraged when you do your best and nobody appreciates it. But these three problems seem to me to be adding up one with another. Problems and discouragements have a way of working together and multiplying their effect. It's not just one plus one plus one. It's two times two times two. And Paul is at a place when we find, when we open Acts chapter 18, where I think Paul was probably more discouraged than at any other time in his life. 
But when I move into chapter 18, I see some things that should have brought encouragement to him, and I think he did. And I think they will bring an encouragement to your life today if you're struggling with discouragement. The first thing I see is the encouragement of moving on. Verse number 1 tells us that Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Discouragement is kind of like a, a, a germ. It hangs around some places and waits on you to come by so it can jump on you and infect you. Many times in our nation's history, there have been times when great epidemics came because of where people were. You go to the Spanish-American War and you find that many thousands more Americans died of yellow fever in Cuba than ever died from combat. Why? It was because of the place they were at. Mosquitoes were all over the place. The, the Panama Canal was not built for a long time because all the workers were dying of disease. It was a swampy, marshy, pitiful place, and disease seemed to lurk there. And sometimes when we're discouraged, we just simply need to move on. Now, it's hard to do. Sometimes there are memories associated with a place, and, uh, and we just keep wanting to go back there. Some of you may remember that old custom of years ago that when you were sparking a girl, there's a term you can ask Grandpa about. When you were doing that, you'd go out to a tree, and you'd cut their initials in that tree. A, B, loves C, D. Oh, what a wonderful thing. But somehow CD dumped AB, moved on to EF, Hutton maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, uh, but AB can't get past this thing, and now he keeps going out in the woods and going up to the trees and saying, I remember that day when I carved my initial, oh, wasn't it wonderful? And she was, oh, no, but now she's gone. And tomorrow, he'll go back. He'll go back and see the tree again and just keep going over and over. Years ago, a man called me who was having trouble with his girlfriend. Why he asked for my advice, I have no idea. But he did. And the conversation went kind of like this. Him, why'd she leave me? Me. Me. Well, I don't know, but I do know that what you need to do right now is get on with your life and not worry about it and go on. Him, okay, I could do that if I knew one thing. What's that? Him, why'd she leave me? And I don't care how many times we waltzed around that same little bush, it always came back to the point, I can't get past it because I just, hey, if I may put it this way, Get over it. Get past it. I looked in the Word of God, and I find that after the, the use of the word Athens here in 18.1, Paul only refers to Athens one time for the rest of his ministry. And that's when he is telling the Thessalonians, I believe, about what he's done. And he just mentions that they went to Athens. I don't think Paul sat there and mourned and, and, and bawled his eyes out over the Athenians. I believe he said, okay, they don't want it. Let's move on down to Corinth. There's always going to be a Corinth. In fact, Paul put it this way when he laid out his philosophy in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. We might plug the Athenians into that. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you want to be encouraged in times of difficulty, get away from those places and those things that recreate that discouragement in your mind. Move on. There's an open road ahead of you. Keep going down it. You'll find your version of Corinth down the road a little ways. Well, verses 2 and 3 tells us of the, in, of the encouragement of fellowship. 
when Paul got to Corinth, he found some people to fellowship with. Mother Nature teaches us that if the antelope gets away from the herd, he is in danger of becoming a guest of honor at a dinner put on by the lions. When, when a lion attacks a herd, he looks for the sick one, the weak one, the one that's by itself, or the one that by his maneuvering he can separate from the safety of the herd. And when that person, when that animal gets off by itself, it is in a bad way. Why is it that when we become discouraged with things, we go off by ourselves and get away from the very place we need to be to have encouragement in God? Somebody makes a mistake, first thing to do is leave the church. Bad move. Don't run from God's people. Run towards God's people. Somebody says, well, I'm too embarrassed. Listen, there is nobody in this church that hasn't done something in their life that was embarrassing. We're just fortunate, some of us, that nobody knows about it. But we know about it. And if we're full of the things of God, we're not going to rub your nose. See there, look what you did, you bum. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to consider ourselves lest we have the same problems that you do. Now, it's more than just putting yourself in a crowd. You need to be with the right people in fellowship. You need to be with people who believe and people who love you and people who care for you. That's one of the reasons why before you ever get discouraged, find you a good church and a place where you can become a part of it because those people will help bring you through your discouragement. Now, when Paul gets to Corinth, there aren't very many believers here, and he runs into Priscilla and Aquila. A husband and a wife who used to live in Rome, but the emperor threw them out. He passed a law that said all the Jews have to leave Rome. Do you suppose that Priscilla and Aquila sat there and said, Oh, goody, goody, we get to leave. We get to close our business, take what we can carry, and move somewhere else. Isn't God great? I don't think so. The point is they experienced the same discouragement in their life that Paul was experiencing in his. They could stand beside Paul and say, Paul, we know how you feel. And God brought them together. Some people would say it was pure chance. I don't believe so. I think their meeting was God's will. And the history of the church and the history of the world changed because these people got together. So look for people that can help you. People, we've all got a common background. God makes a church out of imperfect people. There's none of us that is the best. We're not, we're not the, the cat's pajamas, as they used to say years ago. What that means, I have no idea. But it sounds cool. But the point is, we're not perfect. We all have our flaws. And if we'll stick together, God can bring us through. I believe if you're discouraged, there is somewhere out around you a Priscilla and an Aquila, probably under a different name, but they're there, and they're placed there by God to help you through your discouragement. Well, verse number 3 tells us about the encouragement of activity. Doing something will bring you out of discouragement. Now, this verse tells us that Paul lived with Aquila and Priscilla, but he didn't spend his days sitting around the campfire going, Boy, I blew it in Athens. What a horrible experience. Oh, it was a horrible experience. I just, oh, I wish I had it. No, nah, he got busy. He got busy making tents. That was his trade that he had learned. Productive labor is not a bad thing. <laughs> Society might tell you that it is, but it's not. Because if you can do something right in that area of life, that means you might be able to do something good in another area of life. So by working, Paul keeps his mind occupied. He lets himself heal inwardly if that was necessary. And he's recovered his spiritual and physical balance now. And he's putting out something that he can sell and that will help him later on. So Paul is able to look at this period of life and say, you know, I didn't do too bad. I got well. I recovered. 
I, I, I was discouraged, but now I see reason to be encouraged. And look at this bag full of money I've got from selling tents. There's something good to be said about productive labor and about doing something and keeping yourself busy. An idle mind, if, if an idle mind is the devil's workshop, maybe we're not too far off to say if we'll stay busy, we can evict him from that place. And so stay busy. Do what you can until you can do something else. Point number four, there is the encouragement of a renewed ministry. Paul could not avoid or get away from the calling that God had placed upon his life. Here, even in Corinth, he's, he's found ministering to the people who do not know Christ. He goes to the synagogue every chance he gets, especially on the Sabbath, and he begins to, to tell anybody that would listen to him that Jesus is the Christ. Now, sometimes we feel that uh, we've got this calling from God and we have really blown it because nothing is happening. Let me assure you of this. Everybody has a calling. If I could point at each of you individually right between your eyes, I would tell you that you are called by God to something and it's your responsibility to figure out what it is and then to do it. But just because there are no visible results from what you do does not mean you have failed. Think of it like this. A farmer goes out and he puts his seed in the ground. Does the farmer make the seed grow? The growth comes because of what has already been placed inside the seed by the Creator. All the farmer does is give it conditions whereby that growth can be encouraged. And I can think of people that I have I've known of. I, I think of one missionary for years who went to a foreign field and spent his, his entire time translating the Word of God into the language of the people. And people would send him letters from the states, people supporting him, and they would say, How many people have you won to the Lord this year? And they would say, None. Because they hadn't. People back in the States were going, well, shoot, if you guys ain't going to work any harder than that, we're not going to send you no more money. I think of the great missionary David Livingston. Oh, we think of him as being this, this great man. I read a biography of him one time, and the implication in the biography is that in all the years David Livingston crossed Africa, he may have had one convert. Wow. Boy, there's a failure. No. The success comes in the ministering, not in the results of the ministry in every case. Amen. You do what God called you to do, and God will bring you out of the condition that you are in. If I know I have got God's plan, I have, I'm doing what God would have me to do, then the responsibility for the result falls upon Him and not upon us. I don't have to make God's plan work. I just have to put it out there and let Him make it work. So get busy. Do what God has called you to do. Verse 5, I've got to move along. And I haven't even drunk my water yet, so I've got to get with it. The encouragement of a shared burden. Verse 5 tells us while Paul's doing all this, suddenly there's a knock on the door and two familiar faces show up, Silas and Timothy. Oh, man, I know Paul was glad to see these guys. He hadn't been with them in some time, and, and, and there's just always something about a friendly face that makes everything feel better. Somebody one time said about Brother Danner, who many of you remember, our former visitation pastor. They said, you know, when the man just shows up in the room, you feel like everything's going to be okay. I wish people could say that about me. That's a great thing to have said about you. Because when somebody shows up that has the same burden and the same heartbeat that you do, it's wonderful. And it's an encouragement to anyone who's discouraged to know that somebody else cares about them and is willing to put their shoulder to the wheel and push and help and pick up a responsibility for part of what's going on. So when you're discouraged... Pray that God will bring somebody alongside of you to grab a hold of your, or your job and help. Well, let's keep going. There is the encouragement of divine guidance. 
Verses 5 through 7, Paul keeps ministering and he's not getting anything done. And somehow in the middle of all this, uh, Paul says, well, I think it's time I changed my emphasis. I'm going to go from ministering to the Jews to ministering to the Gentiles. Now, a lot of people would say, what about that is encouraging? It would seem to me that this would be a discouragement to know that you haven't succeeded in doing this. Listen, when you know the direction you're going and you know that God is directing you, you can't help but be encouraged. So Paul has a, a divine guidance. God is able to tell you what you need to do when you need to do it if you'll simply listen to him. And to know that his intelligence and his power and his wisdom is working for you is a great and a wonderful thing. And you can't help but be encouraged to know that God is on your side. Well, let me keep going again a little bit further. There's the encouragement of fruitfulness and a positive focus. What did Paul achieve at, uh, at Corinth? Well, maybe not a lot, but verse 8 starts to list a few people that he did touch. Verse 7 talks about a man named Justice, and verse 8 talks about Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, and all of his house, and many of the, of the Corinthians. It doesn't name them all, but there were some that were, that were one. In other words, Paul did some good stuff. He had some success here, and he started a church. Do you always get everything you want? No. You don't. You don't ever win all you want. You don't ever succeed all you want. You don't ever preach as great a sermon as you want. Or you, don't, you don't ever succeed like you might desire it. But don't say you're a failure if there's some degree of success in what you do. Paul did have some success. He might have looked on certain things and said, I sure wish it would have been different. Well, it wasn't. Paul should look on the things and say, look what we have achieved. We've got this done. I think you, as discouraged as you might be, have some successes you can look at in your life if you'll just look in the right place and in the right direction. And God wants you to look on those rather than on what you think of as failures. Well, verse 9 and 10 Paul has the encouragement of divine communications. God stands with him in the night and speaks with him, and he sees obviously a vision. Now, sometimes when we are discouraged, we'll feel like that the heaven is made out of brass and that you'll never hear anything from God. God has forgot who I am. He has thrown, he has taken my number out of his directory on his big cell phone. And he's lost my address. But this is not so. God's, God knows exactly where you are. And at the right time, he'll show up and talk to you. What he's told Paul is something we can remember. He first of all says, Paul, don't be afraid. How many of our problems will disappear if we're not afraid of them? Being afraid makes things worse than they were. You ever watch the movie The Wizard of Oz? I'm told, I don't think I could stay awake through all of it, but I, I've been told that when you got down to the end, the, the wizard that everybody was so afraid of was this little mousy guy that just was behind a, a special screen that made him look big. I'm reminded of a story that, that is told of Minister Smith Wigglesworth, who is reported to have awakened one night in the middle of the night and seen the devil sitting in a rocking chair in his room. At this point, I would have renovated the house. One guy said, like a golf ball teed off in a tile bathroom, just... <laughs> but according to the story, Mr. Wigglesworth looked at Satan and said, Ah, it's only you, and turned over and went back to sleep. That's cool. If you can do that, you got it down right. And so, Mr. Wigglesworth was not afraid. We don't need to be afraid either. God tells Paul to speak up completely. Don't hesitate to be bold. Be bold. 
He tells him that Jesus is with him. Folks, there is nothing any greater that I can tell you, nothing any greater than you can hear in your discouragement than to know that Jesus is with you. He's sitting right beside you. He's dealing with this. He knows the very feelings of the infirmity that you have. Jesus is with you. Don't ever let go of that. Jesus says to Paul, I will protect you. God knows what's going to happen to you before anybody else even thinks of it. And he knows how to take care of it. He knows how to get you out of whatever problems might come your way. And he will take care of his own. Paul's reminded too, there's some other people around who believe like you do. Sometimes it's easy for us to think we're the only one. We, we kind of have that wagon train mentality, you know. It's time to circle the wagons and get in the middle because anybody that's out there has got to be our enemy. No, the cavalry's coming. <laughs> There's somebody that believes like you do. There's somebody else somewhere that will stand in there with you. Don't give up. God will speak to you when the time comes. There's the encouragement, finally, of long-term effort. Paul knows that he's on target. When all of this has happened, he knows what he needs to do. So with God's wisdom placed in him and God's encouragement placed in his life, Paul steps out and commits himself, I'm going to stick with this task until it is done. And he sits in Corinth for 18 months teaching the Word of God to the church. Listen, if we'll simply stick with God's plan and do what God tells us to do, we will win. You will be encouraged to know that you have done the Word of God. Listen, God can bring encouragement to you in many ways. One of the greatest stories I've ever heard of encouragement was told by a man named Ravi Zacharias. If you've never listened to this man, sharp guy, brilliant, brilliant, beyond brilliant he will go to universities like, like Yale and Harvard and stand up in front of the atheistic student bodies and tell them why he believes in God. Pretty sharp. But he told the story of many years ago, back in the 60s and 70s, working in Vietnam. And the man who was his translator, a good Christian man, uh, worked with him and he developed a real, a, a, a real friendship for this man. Well, the Vietnam War ended, the communists took over, and the communication was broken. One day in the United States, I don't even remember exactly where, I believe he pulled into a a gas station, and he looked across the way, and there was his translator. And after they had reunited and spoken, he asked the man his story, and the man said, listen, this is what happened to me. When you left... I was considered to be unreliable because I had worked with you as a Christian missionary. And I was placed in a camp where they wanted to re-educate me and turn me into a communist. All day long, every day, we heard nothing but communist rhetoric. It was drummed into us. We were not allowed to have any reading material whatsoever except what they approved of. Even at night, it would, it would blast into our mind. They told me that the Americans were bad and that God was dead and and that you weren't worth anything, and if you were going to live, you would be there the rest of your life unless you changed. And he said, I struggled and struggled and struggled, and and I fought it and I fought it, but I became so discouraged that I began to consider renouncing my faith in God and accepting communism just to get out of it. But he said one day something happened to me that uh, didn't seem to be very good. He said, I was assigned the job of cleaning the toilets. Now, I don't consider that to be a very high-ranking job when I think of all the things that happened, and especially in this place because from reading between the lines, the plumbing didn't work well. His job was to clean the toilets. And he said, "I, I, I was scrubbing in this toilet full of stuff, and I happened to see that on the piece of toilet paper, there was writing. And he said, I didn't know what it was, 
But I got it, and I rinsed it off, and I hid it under my coat. And I, he said, I, I, I hid it, and I took it back to my room that night. And I got it out, and I got a match, and I lit the match, and I looked at it. And he said, it, it appears that some of the communist people had begun to use the Word of God as toilet paper. They were tearing sheets out of the Bible and using it for that purpose and flushing it down the drain. And he said, I looked at the toilet paper, and I'm apologetic myself. I can't tell you the exact reference, but the verses that leaped out to him said, Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation and peril and on and on and on it goes. And he said, and I learned through this that I'm more than a conqueror, and God does love me. You tell me about encouragement at a time like that. Man, that'll light your fire. And he said, from then on, I volunteered to clean toilets because I kept pulling pieces of paper out of the toilet and cleaning them off until I had most of the New Testament. And then through a miraculous event, a whole chain of miraculous events, he, was, he escaped. He was one of the boat people. He got to America, and he became a minister in his area working for the kingdom of God. Folks, God don't love that guy any more than he loves you. And if you are discouraged, he wants to give you encouragement. How can I prove that? Well, Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions, and this is the point of the emphasis that I want to make. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. I look that up, and another translation of the Word of God says, The pain that brought us peace was upon him. He took a lot of stripes for our healing, but I think when they drove that, that crown of thorns into his head and when they would hit him and do all of this, he did it so that you would not live with discouragement, but that you could have an encouragement in life. I believe that it is God's will for you to be encouraged. Now, you're probably going to have to do part of it yourself, but I want to tell you, you're in a church and with people who want to see you encouraged. And God wants to see you encouraged. There's no, there's no reason for you to have to live the rest of your life in discouragement. Encouragement is available to you. Bow your heads with me for just a moment. Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you for the encouragement that comes from your word and from hearing your word and from being around others. Help us this night to do what we should to break the bonds of discouragement in somebody's life. In Jesus' name I ask it. With your heads bowed, or not, as you choose. If there is somebody in this building tonight who is fighting discouragement, I want to invite you to come to this altar and let us pray with you and pray that God will bring encouragement to your life. Is there anyone? Okay, that being the case, I want to tell you, we're, I'm looking at a bunch of people who will experience discouragement within the next little while. I'm not a soothsayer. I just know it's coming. And this is the time to prepare ourselves for the discouragement that will come. So I want to invite every one of you to come up to this altar and find yourself a place to pray. Let's pray that God will so strengthen us that the attacks of discouragement that the devil would send will be broken and defeated. Come on, if you will. 